<laughs> Puppet show. Sorry. Um, <coughs> thank you very much. Uh, can I just have... This is one of the best spoken word nights I've actually been to. It's been Woo! fun. Big round of applause for Johnny, please. Big round of applause for us. Uh, along. I'm always guaranteed a big round of applause. This is a tip for all you performers. If you say that at the beginning of your set rather than at the end, when people are just going, no, fuck you. Um, give us a cheer if you like poetry. Woo! That's why it's one of the best nights in the fucking country, man, it really is. It's having comedy gigs and you go, Good shit if you like poetry! <laughs> Where are you going with this? <laughs> is that really? And you've got to kind of reassure them, so I start off with this one. This is my like banker, if you like it. It makes sure that I get the audience on side. Uh, relaxes them, lets them know that poetry can be fun and entertaining, like all you guys know. I bring them underneath the umbrella of love with this poem. Uh, this is a poem about me shooting an eight-month-old baby, and it's called <laughs> That Fucking Fucker's Son. <clears throat> <laughs> it was me! I cried. I held the gun that shot that fucking fucker's son, though the kid wasn't even one. It was me that held the gun, you see? That fucking fucker! He angered me the way he went on in a factory, so I went home, I got me gun, and I shot that fucking fucker's son. Well, most people were livid. <laughs> the papers went spare. Some talked about mobs and lynching and stringing me in the air, because it was me, see, that held the gun that shot that fucking fucker's son. I know! It's not very fair. But you see, his daddy really angered me. The papers screamed out for justice and tried to invoke God's will. I says, hold on half a second, it was God that made me kill. I said, don't you remember David? Him of Goliath fame. Well, years after that, David made an error. And down in anger, God came. And he took from Dave his youngest son, his youngest son, not even one, and the Lord did it in his own name. So I said, following his example, I set out and made my own. And I shot that fucking fucker's son. A sin for which I can never atone. But people will use God to justify anything. Thank you. I'd also like to say it. Fucking wonderful! This is my first gig in the North East. I lived here for ten years, man. I lived in Ashington and New Bedham. I fucking loved it. I really, in fact, this is the last T-shirt I bought here. And uh, if anyone knows if the Star Spangled Chest Wigs are still going, go and see them. They're fucking amazing. Um, this is a, a poem. Yeah, it's kind of religious as well. I'm not a very big religious man. Like, my dad's a Muslim. Uh, he drinks more than I do. Um, my mum's C of E. And uh, they took a very Buddha-like approach to my religious upbringing. They just went, fuck it, find your own path. <laughs> Don't go to the mosque. Don't go to church. Find your own fucking path. What? You want advice? Be nice. That's it. Now fuck off. <laughs> uh, that was pretty much my religious upbringing. But this is, uh, have you ever been to someone's dinner party? How middle class am I? Have you ever been to a dinner party and you've played the dinner party game? With someone who you, you can, right, you can have anybody from history at all. Anybody from history at all. But you want dinner party. And they always ask you when you're at theirs. It's like, what, you'd rather Hitler was here than me? <laughs> <laughs> Feed me. Um, but I took that as like the basis of this. And at my sort of dinner party, I would have my perfect dinner party, I would have God and Richard Dawkins <laughs> just to see how they got on because Richard Dawkins he's not doing much for atheists, I mean I call him Dr Dick, he's just like a ten year old boy, no he doesn't exist no he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't, he doesn't. Oh, God. anyway, uh, this is called Orders uh, my opening night in Edinburgh, I did betray my class origins and someone in the audience went, what? All's do for us. Are you fucking mad? 
So now it's called hors d'oeuvres. At my perfect dinner party, Richard Dawkins was explaining to God why he didn't exist. God took it on the chin and said, no, 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 dear Richard, without me, you wouldn't exist. Dawkins said, no, without me, you wouldn't exist. You are a belief, a thought embedded construct to help man cope with the cold emptiness of the universe. God said, Richard, the universe is not that cold. The sun is 90 million miles away and can tan you very, very well. Go to the Sahara, Richard. Dawkins said, go to hell. God said, been there, seen it, done it. <laughs> Dawkins threw his drink over God. God said, why? You only pulled back his smiting arm. Dawkins said, come on, eh? Come on, eh? Hey, hey, hey. That behaviour is unacceptable. I wish you both didn't exist. You are both equally troublesome to the appreciative atheists. Now leave! Looking back on it, my dinner party was not that perfect. <laughs> Does it really, thank you very much, and you're fucking amazing, you guys. Uh, I've got a, a little leaflet that I'm not a leaflet, it's a chat book. <laughs> girls can't buy it. It's a chap book. What the fuck's that about? Anyway. I'll read some of this. So I'm trying to flog him at the end for three quid, so... I'll read some of this and then I'll get on to the next poem. Uh, That's fucking brilliant. If you'd like to do this, see me afterwards. One of the reasons I don't like religion, uh, A, the homophobia, and B, just the fucking stupidity. Uh, going back to the homophobia, I live in Manchester, which is the gay capital of the UK. We had a running argument with Brighton for a while, like, we're gayer than you, no, we're gayer than you. And I'm really queer as folk, so we fucking win. Fucking win. And um, uh, the area, the gay area in Manchester is uh, called The Village. It's on Canal Street. And whoever did this is a fucking genius. And I don't care if they're homophobic, homosexual, bisexual, trisexual, transgender, whatever. Fucking genius. Canal Street. Someone scribbled off the C and the S. So it just reads Anal Street. <laughs> And every month, the council replaced the sign. And within 48 hours, fuck off. <laughs> Genius. I did this as part of the Gay Pride Festival uh, in Manchester. I wanted to have, like, the big pink thumbs up before I could sort of take it anywhere else and, and perform it. And I performed it all the way around the world. So I did get the big pink the big pink thumbs up, which is why I'm going to perform it for you now. Uh, this is called I Loved You Like a Brother Till I Found Out You Were a Cocksucker. <laughs> gay! He's gay! You must be mad. I've known him since we were lads, never. Never in all the world. He hung go around with a load of girls. He pushes poo. <laughs> pushes poo? Look how twat you mate if I fucking have to. He's queer as fuck. Queer as fuck. Don't smile on with your fucking neck, bro. Now wind it in, you're having a laugh. That lad's as queer as I'm giraffe. Here he comes now. Say it to his face. Swear that, mate. Tell him. You're straight. What? <laughs> what, what do you mean? You're not. Me mate's as straight as black lace. <laughs> I never could tell from his face. Never could tell from the way that he talked. I couldn't even tell from the way he walks. He's always been a stand-up geezer. I mean, he put me to bed when I was in Ibiza. <laughs> <laughs> he shared me bed when we were kids. 
I wonder now what he was thinking behind closed lids. Then at school we shared the showers. At times he seemed like cock out up to hours, days, and he's gay. I'm sorry, mate. We've got to part. I'm not having your eyes on me ass. I fear deep down you fancy me the amount of time you've spent in me company. What do you mean, of course not? <laughs> Hold on, mate! What's wrong with me? <laughs> All poets talk about love, and I am no exception. So this one's called Love Problem Number 13. The blowjob. <laughs> she sucked me in the morning until the end of night. She sucked me down an alleyway, well out of plain sight. Her tongue flickered around my bum hole, and it wrapped around my eggs. And when it was all over, sorry mum, <coughs> was all over, she stood on shaky legs. We should be together, she said. You'd never have to wank. She wiped my cum from her lips and introduced herself as Frank. <laughs> that one's uh, based on a true story, uh, that one. Now, you see, I can't really do, like, what is, in, essen in essence, a homophobic poem joke after I've done the cocksucker thing, you see, it doesn't, it doesn't work, I'll, so I'll be honest with you, absolutely fucking honest with you, the only thing I have got against homosexuals, right, seriously, is occasionally my cock. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, you've been walking down the street and someone says, fuck me, monkey, you look right depressed, would a blowjob help? <laughs> and you think to yourself, <laughs> probably would. <laughs> if not, definitely worth a try. <laughs> there aren't many problems that you face in life that can't be in some way eased by the good application of oral sex. In fact, I'll take that back. Good or bad. The view, it really, I, I, like every other straight man in this room, I am 90% straight. 90%. We need that 10%. That 10% is the oil on the wheels of civilization and keep the thing rolling forward. You need that 10% to be able to go, Cheers, Bob! It is a new haircut. <laughs> you need that 10% to be able to watch the football and go, Giggsy, lovely little mover. <laughs> You need that 10% to be able to go, Tony, that was the best blowjob I've ever had in my fucking life, mate. We need that 10% because without it, we would be living in this 100% straight, testosterone fueled Mad Max apocalyptic vision of the future. And if anyone can remember Mad Max, big, big muscles, tight, tight leather. 100% straight is completely gay, but in denial. Look at Putin and his horseback riding. Yeah, take a photo of me, baby. Take a photo of me, baby. Yeah, I'll do it for you. Yeah, tease my nipples, you love me. Um, it's fucking weird. We live in the age of the metrosexual folks, and let's face it, there is nobody out there that can quite bend it like Beckham. Um, <laughs> Oh, I'm gonna run out. Oh, it's St. George's Day yesterday. Hey, St. George, England, we're nice. Hey. Yeah, exactly. Everyone doesn't know where they stand on that at the moment. Yeah, or well, colonialism, maybe. I don't know. Yeah, football team. Uh, big shit. Uh, so I wrote this one for the BNP. Um, it, was, it was when they got into um, the European Parliament, which I, was, I thought was fucking brilliant. The BNP got into Europe and I was like, yes, learn that other countries exist. This is so educational. And it's the same with UKIP now, you know, because like, fuck, we have got to stop the rise of UKIP. Ten years ago, they had no MPs. And today, they have no MPs. <laughs> the indomitable rise of UKIP. No, you are cunts. Um, 
This is uh, actually, I did introduce the BMP as couldn't uh, Edinburgh, and I got heckled by a 73 year old lady in the audience. And what was even worse, she put a hand up to heckle me. I know. And I went, I've got a racist grandma in the audience. How do I deal with this? Ah! And so, you know, because when you get heckled, man, you've got to fucking shoot the audience down immediately. You've got to show you are the person in charge. Act, audience, you are in control. I couldn't say anything to this woman because she came from the back, so no one had actually heard her say anything. So it'd just be me attacking a 73-year-old woman <laughs> for no real reason whatsoever. So summoning up the, all of the hours and experience that I have on this stage, I turned around and went, Yes, me love. <laughs> what seems to be the problem? I said, I object. I object to you describing the BNP as cunts. Because <laughs> <laughs> they have neither the taste nor the depth to qualify. <laughs> I ran off stage and gave her the biggest fucking hug I could. So this is dedicated to her and it's called St. George. Can I go? For hi, England and St. George. Wrote Shakespeare the Bard and made him ours. The ever ready, reliable St. George who stuck with us through two world wars. St. George, patron saint of syphilis. <laughs> and so he spread like a disease and conquered all the seven seas, bringing civilization with cutting steel, a hearty hussar, and a damn good eye for the other fellow's real estate. For God and Harry and St. George, patron saint of Beirut. And there the dragon he did slay in a place aptly called St. George's Bay. For God and Harry and St. George, patron saint of leprosy. Like a leper's skin, the empire cracked. Bits fell off the system, nearly collapsed. The puss inside began to weep. And by the way, St. George is also patron saint of sheep. <laughs> For God and Harry and St. George, patron saint of the Teutonic Knights. The Germans. <laughs> <laughs> I must admit, I was a bit surprised, but we won't dwell on the wars or economic zeal. Instead, move along to a different field, cutting through the mystery. Let's have a look at this man's history. St. George was a Roman soldier from Anatolia, born in the late third century. All sources are, however, hagiography, which means not the verifiable truth. In 303, he was ordered to take part in a persecution, but he confessed himself to be a Christian and he criticized the royal decision. An enraged Diocletian ordered torture, followed by execution, so he was lacerated on the wheel of swords and then decapitated outside in the Comedia's walls. For God and Harry and St. George, the shout still out in a world of sports where every shaven head is clad in a white and red striped flag and we still cheer at the sight of the crest and despite all evidence, just look at the World Cup that's coming up. <laughs> we hold that England is the best! For God and Harry and St. George, patron saint of agricultural workers, archers, armourers, butchers, sheep, shepherds, field workers and farmers, for touch, the order of the Gazas, riders, satellites, Africa, soldiers, Canada, Cappadocia, Catalonia, Ethiopia, Florida, Italy, Genoa, Georgia, Lithuania, Malta, Monica, in Sicily, Slovenia, Amersfoort in the Netherlands, Corinthians, a Brazilian football team, and naturally England, equestrians, Palestinian Christians, and Adrafasif, Palestine, Aragon, Beirut, and Lebanon, and Venice, Gozo, Moscow, Constantinople, Skinnesis, Lot, the Plague, and Portugal, Cavalry, Chivalry, Haldane, and Germany, Horses, Horsemen, Horsewomen, and Leprosy, the Scouts, Greece, Herpes, Hyde, and the Teutonic Knights. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you George. He's a patron saint of everything in sight. <laughs> Thank you. You guys are absolutely fucking brilliant. Um, I can, I've got a choice for you now. I can either stick to me time or I can run over. And it's up to you, because I can, I can give you... I can give you the introduction to the poem, or I can give you the poem. Oh, introduction? Poem. Oh, okay, introduction oh, might be run over. No, just do it. Oh. The worst gig that I ever did was in a place called Harrogate. Do you all know where Harrogate is? Yeah. It's free posh there, isn't it? Yeah. I didn't know that. <laughs> and I was supporting a TV comedian at a comedy club. And I killed the audience in a bad way. I, I should have fucking known, man. I should have known. When 
It's the only comedy gig that I've done that had fucking chandeliers. I should have known, but I didn't. They shot me up. And what I did was I likened the current government um, to a horror film. Um, Hostel, if anyone's aware of anyone's aware of that. And what I did was I had the spirit of Britannia over here. And she was 21, and she was beautiful, and she was naked. Her nipples pointed to heaven, her vagina was shaven in a neat little landing strip motif. Sorry, Mum. <laughs> it's quite, quite delicious. Something wrong with the picture. She's chained upside down to the ceiling. And in through this doorway, with his pudgy smug face and his stupid fucking suit, comes George Osborne. <laughs> and he picks up a cutthroat razor and he goes over to the dangling Britannia. At this point, the audience went. <laughs> about Cousin George. <laughs> and George goes, cut, cut, cut. I'm going to see how many cuts you can take before you die. <laughs> I'm watching on a monitor 150 miles away in an underground bunker a Cameron and Clegg and they're just mutually masturbating <laughs> each other like this and Clegg's turning around to Cameron going I'm not too sure about this Dave I am not too sure about this at all I did not sign up for this man I did, he's going fucking mental in there he's going mental and Cameron's just going harder harder come on Nick jump on the train Choo 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 And George has gone mental in this room. He slices over the stomach and removes the intestines, the guts of the country. That's the armed services. Don't worry, we don't need them. G4S will take care of everything. And then he pulls out the heart of the country. I'm sorry, that's the nation's youth. Kids, you want an education, it's going to cost you 50 fucking grand. Then he starts severing away at the breast of the country. And I'm sorry, folks, that is the nipple that we all suck from. It's the NHS, and it is going. They're getting rid of it. They do not like it, because it gives us something for free. That is how evil these people are. Boom! At this point, the audience was like this. <laughs> George unzips himself, pulls out his tiny cock, and jams it into the dead, open, gaping mouth of Britannia. They jizz all over the screen. Osborne jizzes into Britannia's mouth, and George Osborne's jism is a mixture of acid, bile, and pure fucking smugness! <laughs> and it melts through a brain pan, and her brains hit the floor like West Semolina. And over here. <sighs> Ooh. Ooh. Cameron turns to Clay. He says, I told you, Nick. It's just like it was when we were at school. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't get invited back. <laughs> to be honest, I don't trust fiery red Ed Miliband. And it, I think strikes are wrong. Fuck off, Ed! <laughs> there is nobody speaking for the people of this country at the moment. No. And that is a real fucking problem that we need to address. Yeah. It really is. This next poem is called Politicians. And it's an acrostic poem. See how I whip that round? <laughs> this is too stimulus to actually high intellect. An acrostic, tell me more. Well, I shall. <laughs> acrostic poem is when, like, the words going across. Like the first letter of every word, or like every line going down, 
spells out a word, or in this case, two words. And this is the pantomime part of the show, because you can tell I've always wanted to work with children. <laughs> this is the, <laughs> the pantomime part of the show where I'll go, and what does that spell out, boys and girls? And you'll shout out the answer. And we'll all be so happy that you've got it so right and so loud, we're getting a big circle and glad hand each other. <laughs> um, I will say that the people in the Midwest of America got this, so uh, no pressure. <laughs> This is called Politicians. For the love of truth, the righteous they upstand, understanding the common folk and how to guide the land. Court, Twix Corporation and the common man. Knights of the modern age will be knighted if it goes to plan. Interest rates, budget books and the drums of war. Need newsworthy sound bites to grab the votes of the poor. Creed, a passion that these people surely wouldn't stoop to. New word. <laughs> Women are allowed in now, equality takes from getting used to Another dull announcement, another dull day Needs newsworthy soundbites to keep the truth at bay Knights of the modern age, armed in corrupted steel Every politician knows how the voters really feel Robbers, rapists and muggers are held in higher regard Sod the politicians and sod their voting cards What are politicians, folks? Fucking before you go to bed, you will feel fantastic in the morning. Thank you. This is my, uh, where am I? My last one? Do another? I don't know, I don't know. Well, I'm going to do a last one, and I might do another one uh, after it, if you want. Uh, so, I've obviously had a difficulty with patriotism. You've got that. Can I just have a massive shout out? Where are you going? <laughs> oh, no, you're not. Whatever the reason. If you need to piss, piss on my face. No, I'm joking. No, no, that's fine. No, no. But if anyone's into that, see me after the show. Uh, sorry, before I... Uh, okay, throw it out there. Um, I'm not really into water sports. Has anyone done water sports? Like, I, 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 my girlfriend wanted me to piss on her, and thank God she wanted me to do it in the shower because I'm, I'm trying to go on the wet, run the water. <laughs> you know what? Anyway, <clears throat> back into the thing. Uh, <clears throat> so, where was I? <laughs> run the water, run the water, come on. <laughs> Let's have a shower part. Anyway. Um, that's become big over here. There's a lot of American shit's become big over here. Like prom nights and shower parties and shit. Anyway, meandering. It's right. Uh, so, I actually haven't seen these guys for a fucking long time, and they're mates of mine from Washington. So, can I just have a big round of applause for Ben, B, and Eloise? Please, lovely uh, to be able to perform for you. And Eloise uh, was a baby. Uh, and I took her to the anyway. That's, I, you shouldn't have heard this coming from my mouth, Eloise, but your, your parents brought you. Uh, so, yeah, I've always had a difficulty with patriotism. The reason for that is uh, my grandfather was from the Adagi tribe, he was one of the 12 tribes of the Caucasus Mountains. And what happened was he fled Stalin during the Second World War and he met my grandma, who's Belarus, which was Poland then, so she's Polish. And she was fleeing Stalin, because like fleeing Stalin was really popular during the Second World War. Where Stalin's like, oh, fuck me. So what they did was they fled to Austria and um, they walked over the Alps and uh, into Italy and he got married in Italy, which was dead romantic, it was lovely. But there's fucking bombs dropping in that because there was a war going on. So he walked back over the Alps. I've never told me grandma it's a long way to the shops because she goes, bang, I walked across the Alps twice! <laughs> Which is fair enough. And uh, they, they went back into Austria in a displaced persons camp or a refugee camp as we'd call it down. That's where my father was born in Austria. And then he came over to the UK. He settled in Manchester in 1949. My dad grew up, he met my mum, who was a scouser. Uh, which means she's from Liverpool, which means that she's Irish. And three of her grandparents are. And the other one's French. So it's a Circassian, Polish, Austrian, French, Irish scouser. Patriotism has been a funny old fish for me growing up. It really has. But I learned to love the country. And this is a poem about how I did. Uh, and this is it. And it's called uh, How to Be Patriotic Without Sounding Like a White Supremacist. <laughs> and I hope Nigel Farage 
rhyming with garage, will take it on unless someone happens to shoot him. Throwing out ideas, seeing if anybody will take it. <clears throat> Ever since I was a kid, I felt different. The only child at school with Circassian name at the height of Reagan and Thatcher's anti-Soviet game made me understand the term, the reference and the frame for that word, outsider. And growing up in society, I noticed the have-nots, the have-not-a-lots, and the hypocrisy of the people at the top. My first time as a protester was age seven, trying to stop Margaret Thatcher taking away free milk from schools. We tried, we failed. Maggie Thatcher, milk snatcher! Maggie Thatcher, milk snatcher! Was the playground protesters lament, as I said, we were seven, it was worthwhile, and it didn't matter that I'm lactose intolerant. <laughs> and then seeing Ethiopia on the news later, a friend and I ran 20 rounds at a housing estate to raise money and protest on and protest more and protesting the Iraqi war. I wondered what all my protests had been for because they affected no change. Then earlier on this year, something happened to me. Rather cheesily in poetry, you call it an epiphany. <laughs> Whilst walking down a Manchester street buying my groceries, I said hello to the Pakistani owner and I purchased an African yam. And I walked down Rush Holmes Curry Mile, past a hundred Asian restaurants and further past a Sikh temple, a Hindu temple, a mosque and a church. And I saw Britain as a nation that could one day be without curse because the first homo species arrived here 900,000 years ago. And in the years since that time, a thousand other races have felt that the climb was perfect. And the British, in always adopting foreign customs, have fostered a British evolution. The Beakers, the Basques, they built Stonehenge with technology from Spain and Portugal. Homo heidelbergensis, the Neolithics, the Celts, who were originally a tribe from Gaul. The Belgae, the Romans, the Greek, the Jutes, the Frisians, the Saxons, the Angles, the Danes, the Normans, the Vikings, the Wrangles for power that shaped this land that gave birth to the modern Britain. The place I am from. And each new wave has been infused, each bringing different technology and tools, each all adding to the overall dream, a united nation of outsiders. And the laws of change and come to reflect the needs of the few, balanced, direct with the needs of the many. From the Magna Carta that originally restricted the monarchy to you are innocent, mate, till you've been proven guilty. A united nation of outsiders that can learn from each other, lean on each other, share the burden with each other, not to become one with each other, because let's face it, that is a glib wank marketing phrase. <laughs> but celebrate. Viva la difference. That is the richness of this place and cramped, congested, overcrowded, busy, dizzy Britain is my hope for the future human race and though we are nowhere near, nowhere near this utopia today, I am proud to be striving for it. I'm proud to be part of the UK. Thank you all for your time. <laughs>